Hello and welcome to today's uh, lecture, which is on the mechanisms behind peripheral and central sensitization. So by the end of this lecture, you should be comfortable with sensitization of nociceptors and how it leads to mechanical and thermal hyperalgesia. How peripheral sensitization is produced in part by upregulation up -regulation of receptors. The difference between primary and secondary hyperalgesia and central sensitization and the similarity with long-term potentiation and memory. So, hyperalgesia and allodynia are two commonly used clinical terms. And it's important that we uh, have a full understanding of these. If we take this graph, this um, graph here, which is of stimulus temperature against um, pain ratings, we see that in a non-injured um, individual, um, a person will perceive a, a heat stimulus as painful at around 34, sorry, 43 to 44 degrees centigrade. And as the stimulus increases, the, um, the pain rating increases as well. So we get to a, a stimulus temperature of about 49 degrees C. And you can see that it's almost 2 out of 10 on the pain scale. So if we take um, 43 degrees here, we can see that that has a pain rating of zero, so it's an innocuous stimuli, i.e. it's non-noxious. But once we injure the tissue, so we cause a thermal burn to the tissue, the area becomes sensitive, and now the, the pain rating of the same 43 degree temperature stimulus is four. Okay, so we have there an example where we have a non-painful stimulus that after injury and sensitization, we are getting a, a painful stimulus. Okay. Now, here if we look at, if we take 49 degrees here as an example, we see that in the uninjured um, tissue or person, we have a, a pain rating of about 2. And once we damage the tissue and do the pain ratings again, it goes up to around 7, 7.5. Okay, so here we have a painful stimulus, which after injury has become more painful. Okay, and this increase in pain pain rating to a pain, painful stimulus is what we term hyperalgesia and the sensation of, a, of, a, of pain to a otherwise non-painful stimulus is what we call allodynia. Okay, so hyperalgesia is an increased pain to a painful stimulus and allodynia is a painful response to a otherwise non-painful stimulus. Okay, so we'll mention these terms Quite, a, quite often as we go along, so it's important to be comfortable with those. Um, this is a similar graph that just explains the same sort of thing. So if we look to the right-hand side, we see in the dark blue, this is sort of normal healthy tissue, and we have a, um, a situation whereby we increase the noxious stimulus, and we get a, a sort of slowly increasing pain sensation. Then the pain sensation rapidly increases with a, with a small amount of stimulus increase and then it sort of peters off again. So a normal kind of sigmoid curve there. And then if we injure the tissue, it pushes the whole, whole um, graph to the left, whereby the area that was otherwise mildly noxious is now much more noxious, and that's the hyperalgesia. And the, the foot of the curve, which was previously innocuous, now becomes painful, and that's allodynia. Okay, so make sure you're comfortable with these before we proceed. Okay, so peripheral sensitization. Here we have an example whereby we've uh, injured um, a tissue and we get an area of primary hyperalgesia surrounding it. And then in a greater area around that, we get an area of secondary hyperalgesia. So we're gonna look at a little bit about how these, uh, how, the, how the two occur, the mechanisms behind them, and the difference between this primary and secondary hyperalgesia. So peripheral sensitization, what we get is a tissue injury causing a damage to, to cells locally, so for example burn. This will produce the red flare, so that area we see there, there which we call the red flare is uh, neurogenic inflammation caused by um, a dumping of neuropeptides in the peripheral branches of the damaged um, nociceptors. Okay, and if we look at this, uh, this, this picture here, we can see a hand and we see the dark blue circles, A and D. This is where the tissue's been damaged. And then the area B in between is in this red flare. 
obviously it's not red, but um, the, the light blue areas where you'd see a red flare. So that's the, the, the neurogenic inflammation as a response to the small area of damaged tissue. Okay, and this is all hypersensitive. If we look at um, the, the graph C there, we can see that the, uh, for a painful stimulus, we get a, a much greater increase in pain sensitivity after the damage. So in the area of site A, which is tissue damage, we get a, a, a pain, a thermal hyperalgesia, okay, which is, this is called primary hyperalgesia. Okay, and that's sensitive to both heat and touch. So in area A and D, where the tissue is actually damaged, we get increased sensitivity to both heat and touch. So primary hyperalgesia, if it's sort of thermal, thermal pain or noxious pain, or primary allodynia, if it's a pri previously innocuous uh, sensitivity. Now the area adjacent to it, so this is B, the red flare area, so in light blue in the picture. Um, this, for some reason, this actually becomes less sensitive to heat, uh, which we call thermal hypoalgesia. Okay, that will become more relevant in the next lecture when we talk about uh, modulation of pain. Okay, so the area of primary hyperalgesia, okay, that is equates to peripheral sensitization. So we, when we talk about peripheral sensitization, we are talking about increased sensitivity to the to the peripheral afferent nerves, okay, so the nociceptors in this case. Now we've sort of seen this picture already previously. Um, so one form of peripheral sensitization is via upregulation of existing receptors, okay. So we saw how um, lots of algogenic or, or pain-causing um, chemicals such as serotonin, histamine, prostaglandins, acid, etc. Um, will stimulate specific molecular receptors on the nociceptive terminal and that will cause a, an alteration in, in enzyme protein cascades which will upregulate or sensitize the um, ion channels that are normally responsive to acids, to chemicals, to mechanical deformation um, as well as upregulating uh, nociceptive specific sodium channels. Okay, so the, the, the mediators of inflammation will upregulate these channels so that now they are more responsive to the same concentration of chemicals or for the same mechanical um, stimulation. Okay, and that will lead to a, a greater influx of ions, which is more likely to set off the nociceptor, causing an action potential and therefore giving the sensation of pain. Okay, so this is sensitization. It's an increased response to the um, same amount of stimuli, but this is caused by local change in the receptors at the uh, peripheral terminal. Another method is whereby the, the, the cell body, which is in the dorsal root ganglion for sensory nerves, um, normally, under normal conditions, we see a uh, cell body produces these channels and it um, translates them to the peripheral terminal as well as translating them to the uh, central terminal. And obviously that's the normal mechanism by which they they, they make, they build these protein channels and, and ship them to the, um, the nerve endings. Now under the, an inflammatory condition, what we see is uh, numerous sort of chemical factors such as nerve growth factor, which will be released by uh, immune cells and by damaged tissue. Um, and that is taken in via uh, special receptors in the, in the uh, peripheral terminal, and that will be translated all the way to the cell terminal, to the cell body, which will then start to create this increased production of ion channels. So here we're looking at the TRIP channel, which is specific to, to acids and chemicals and heat. Um, and that will start to ship numerous, um, uh, much increased number of these receptors to the peripheral and the central terminal. So now we have a, an increased um, amount of new receptors. Okay, so previously we saw an upregulation of the existing receptors. Now we see an increased number of receptors. So the, the same concentration of chemical will have more receptors to stimulate and therefore will set off a greater reaction. Now, primary allodynia um, is fairly specific and it involves silent nociceptors. So hopefully you remember these mechanically insensitive afferents we talked about. Um, and these are nociceptors that normally don't respond to mechanical stimulus, but when sensitized with a chemical um, such as inflammation, they, they become much more sensitive to mechanical stimuli. Okay, in this uh, experiment, we see how before um, an injection, a, a part of the tissue will not re be responsive to a, to a mild mechanical stimulus. So in this case, it's five bars of pressure. 
and we see no no mechanical no um, neural activity. Now, if we inject a chemical into the skin, okay. So initially saline, we see hardly any difference in terms of the number of impulses in the nerves. But when we inject a, a mix of sort of bradykinin and, and histamine and other mediators of inflammation, we see a massive discharge of the nerves. So these silent um, silent nociceptors suddenly become highly active once stimulated with the chemical. And then if we look here 30 minutes after the injection, we'll see that the same five bars of pressure is causing a, a large amount of neural activity, um, which is, suggests they've now been sensitized. Okay, so these are mechanical nociceptors that are normally silent and they now become responsive to mechanical pressure. Now obviously they weren't responsive before, so this is a form of um, allodynia, um, rather than hyperalgesia because it was non-painful before. Now, secondary hyperalgesia. So we've just talked about primary hyperalgesia, which is sensitization of the peripheral nociceptive fibers, whereas secondary hyperalgesia suggests a central cause, so central sensitization. If we look at the picture on the left here, we'll see the same sort of picture with the hand, and I've put in red here the, the red flare area, so damage to... Um, part A or D will cause sensitization of that to heat and um, mechanical stimulus and then you get this red flare response which will be sensitive to um, mechanical stimulus as well and that's all primary, remember that's primary hyperalgesia. Now if we look at the dotted line around here, this is an area outside of the receptive field of, of the damaged neurons. Okay, So the area within that that's uh, white are nociceptive terminals which are not the same nociceptors that are causing the red flare reaction. Now if we look at A, B and C there we'll see that before the burn they have a certain threshold of pain fairly high and after the burn all three reduce. So site A, B and C all show mechanical hyperalgesia. All right, That means they're uh, sensitive to um, sort of a higher, higher response rate to a the same stimulus. The area immediately surrounding the red flare is sensitive to mechanical but not thermal stimuli, so we know it's a different mechanism to just normal neuron damage. And here we can just see that the, the temperature before and after is exactly the same in terms of response. So this tells us that the area in that white area that's, that's not within the red is innervated by uninjured nociceptors and therefore indicates an increased responsiveness centrally in the dorsal horn. Other, other tests show us that it's actually mediated by A delta fibers, but the, the main change occurs centrally. Okay, and we'll see how that occurs in a second. Um, allodynia, um, so uh, like stroking, for example, um, stroking of the skin, is mediated by A beta fibers. So these are the low threshold mechanoreceptors, and they normally code for a low threshold stimulus and therefore not pain, not noxious. But once sensitization occurs peripherally and centrally, it is the A beta fibers that mediate this. Okay, so what we looked at previously was A delta fibers showing mechanical hyperalgesia because it was an already painful stimulus being detected as more painful. Okay, this is a non painful stimulus being picked up by the low threshold of mechan mechanoreceptors, which are the A beta fibers, going to the dorsal horn, but now by the time it gets to the brain, it's perceived as a painful stimulus. The reason we know it's A-beta fibers, um, one of the ways you can we can show this is to inflate a pressure cuff. This blocks off the blood supply, and before we get loss of the C and A delta fibers or, or ischemia to them, the larger myelinated A-beta fibers will um, will become ischemic. Okay, so that can actually reduce uh, not just um, light touch as you expect, but also the allodynia. So that's one way of sort of showing that it's um, due to the A beta fibers. Um, at the same time, heat and cold pain are not altered, okay, which are, remember, uh, C and A delta fibers. Um, in a similar manner, if you put an uh, anesthetic onto the uh, limb with allodynia, the allodynia will stop, whereas punctate hyperalgesia, so pinprick, will persist. So again, that shows us that there's a slightly different mechanism there. Um, and it also suggests that the allodynia has an ongoing dependence on inputs from the sensitized area. So the sensitivity, the sensitization in the damaged tissue 
is causing a change in the dorsal horn, which is causing the A beta fibers and where they um, sort of uh, join to become sensitized. Okay, so there's an ongoing stimulus from the periphery as well, even though we're talking about a central mechanism. Again, this just shows uh, how we can sort of prove this. If we take, if we stimulate, for example, the common perineal nerve, um, we get a sensitized a sens um, sensation of a sort of normal tactile sensation. Okay, so you stimulate the nerve, and it feels like you're being brushed on the skin. Now, if we inject capsaicin to the area around it, so that's chili oil, we'll get a red flare reaction as it stimulates the um, C fibers. We we'll get a red flare reaction, and if it encapsulates or surrounds the area of tactile sensation, so this would be where those A beta fibers are terminating. Um, not only do we get the area of primary hyperalgesia caused by the capsaicin, but we also get, by stimulating the nerve, we get the sensation of light touch as, as well as pain. So stimulating the A beta fiber gives us a painful stimulus, a painful response. Okay, so what's happening there is the capsaicin is irritating C fibers, which is going along to the dorsal horn, sensitizing the dorsal horn in the spinal cord, and then the A beta fibers, which are attached there, when they get stimulated, they um, will be perceived eventually by the brain as being uh, causing pain because of the central sensitization. Okay, and in the last picture there, we show that if the uh, area of primary hyperalgesia, the red flare, uh, reduces, so it's just surrounding the cap, the um, um, the area that the capsaicin was put in, but not the area of tactile sensation. Stimulation of that nerve will only cause um, a sensation of light touch. It will not cause a painful stimuli. Okay, so that kind of uh, tells us that um, allotin is mediated via irritation to the C fibers, but is carried by the low threshold mechanoreceptors, or stimulation of those is what gets perceived as pain and allodynia. Okay? So, just a little bit more neuroanatomy. If we go into dorsal horn, um, we'll see that we have uh, various different um, neurons. So in the superficial um, lamina, we have these projection neurons. These will be nociceptor specific, so they get stimulated and go straight to the the brain and brainstem to code for nociception. And these are contacted here by a, a, um, a substance P uh, peptidergic C fiber in the dorsal root ganglion. Okay, and if we look on the picture on the left hand side, just highlighted here how some of the stains specific for these projection neurons um, using the NK1 receptor, which is specific, particularly a receptor for substance P. Uh, Member substance P is a neuropeptide produced by these C fibers and are very much involved in inflammation. This picture here shows a stain for substance P, whereas the green one either side of it shows a stain for the substance P receptor. And then the fourth picture on the right there shows the sort of joined up picture where you have the substance P um, vesicles and the uh, neurokinin uh, substance P receptors on the second order neuron. So the fact it's staying completely green shows you just how many of these receptors there are. And actually, if you look at the picture below that, that picture, again, is created purely from stains for these receptors. So it just shows you just how many, how many millions of receptors there are scattered on these, these nerves. Um, we also have these wide dynamic range neurons. So these are projection neurons that take in both nociceptive and innocuous stimuli. And on the picture, the green picture on the left there, you can see the small white star at the bottom. That's a wide dynamic range neuron. Um, and I just wanted to highlight here how um, this is the nerve terminal contacting the postsynaptic membrane of the projector neuron. And the small light blue vesicles are glutamates, and they will, um, they will fuse with the presynaptic membrane in the, in the classic way and go through the synaptic cleft and then into the postsynaptic uh, receptors are, such as the NMDA receptors and the AMPA receptors. So that's your classic kind of pathway. Whereas the substance PV schools, the larger ones there, um, come out of pores in the sides of the, the um, neuron synapse and will diffuse to, into a much wider area into these special receptors for the substance P, the NK1 receptors. So glutamate is much more specific just to the pre terminal, whereas substance P diffuses out and will um, 
will travel some distance. Okay, so that just gives us a hint of the sort of breadth of stimulus that substance P can do, as opposed to glutamate, which is a much more fast and localized acting neurotransmitter. Okay, so substance P and CGRP, these are neuropeptides, will become very important later on as we talk more about um, sensitization. Right, now this picture you've seen before when we talked about the um, pain gate theory and how nociception um, can be inhibited by a low threshold mechanoreceptor acting via a, a GABA interneuron. Well, within a dorsal horn we have these projector neurons and we also have lots of inhibitory and ex excitatory interneurons. The interneurons actually make up the majority of spinal neurons, so they're far more than there are of the projector neurons. Um, they can be divided into these two classes, inhibitory and excitatory. Um, excitatory interneurons generally use glutamate, whereas inhibitory interneurons use GABA and glycine as their neurotransmitters. Okay, and if you block the GABAergic neurons, that's one way in which we can produce this allodynia. So now you have, as the picture shows, this low threshold mechanoreceptor. So this is a beta, a beta fiber. Um, would normally contact and, and stimulate the GABA interneuron, which would then inhibit the original impulse from the low threshold mechanoreceptor. If you take that away, we get disinhibition, and now the low threshold mechanoreceptor can directly activate the projector neuron, eliciting, eliciting a uh, sensation of pain. Okay, so that's just one mechanism that we get of, of uh, allodynia via these A beta fibers. Uh, now, another sp uh, phenomenon specific to the dorsal horn is this, this uh, thing called wind-up. Now, what we see here in the diagram is um, the stimulus. So if you see the bottom line is an even stimulus, so evenly spaced stimulus, but close enough to cause this wind-up phenomena. And what we see in the main picture, the spikes of the neurons, are these huge spikes every time the stimulus is given. But as it goes along, we start to get more spikes, more spikes, um, and then to the right of the picture, the, the neuron is firing almost rep repetitively and spontaneously. Okay, so this, this sensation of, uh, this phenomenon of wind-up is the ability of um, the uh, spaced-out stimuli to increase the firing of nerves almost spontaneously. So it generally occurs after, after an intense or persistent barrage of noxious stimuli. Okay, so it can be just a single intense stimulus or it can be lots of repetitive stimuli. It's frequency dependent. So if you space them out too much, you won't get this phenomena. Okay, so it has to be a fairly frequent stimulus to cause a wind up. Only occurs in the C fibers. So this takes us back to the uh, this peptidergic phenomena. It will happen in some A, a delta fibers, but it must be peptidergic. Okay, we'll mention one a bit more later. What's happening at the dorsal horn, if we look into it, is on the left-hand side you see the A delta input, um, and what you normally get with A, a, so a beta, these are innocuous fibers, a fast membrane depolarization and quite a clear um, synaptic transmission. Okay, whereas with the C fiber, you see the, the glutamate being fired into glutamate, glutamate receptors, but also substance P, and that activates ion channels in the um, in the projector neuron, which makes them more sensitive to um, things like substance P coming from it. So we know that wind-up requires both NMDA and NK1 receptors, which have a glutamate and substance P receptors. So there's something about the glutamate acting as a fast localizing sort of synaptic transmission, and then there's substance P leaking out the sides. And if you remember in the last lecture, we talked about the neuropeptides having a much more uh, so a slower build-up and decay rather than the fast localized action potential. So for this phenomenon of wind-up, we, we, we need uh, glutamates and sort of normal synaptic transmission. We also need these neuropeptides and this sort of slow build-up, which, which gives us this wind-up phenomena. Okay, and wind-up is extremely important when we look at um, long-term central sensitization. Now, there, there are several states of central sensitization. Okay, it's quite often, uh, it's easy to think of central sensitization as, as being chronic pain, and this is definitely not the case. Um, we've already seen with the picture of the, the sort of the burnt hand, the thermal lesion, that central sensitization causes mechanical um, hyperalgesia or allodynia within seconds, within seconds or minutes of a burn. 
Okay, and it's very much an adaptive response to try and make us, try and protect us from damaging that uh, body part further. Okay, so central sensitization in the early stage is very much a normal adaptive mechanism to protect, um, to protect the body part. Okay, now what we're seeing here in this picture, um, this is normal nociceptive transmission. So again, I don't want to go too much into the different uh, receptors and stuff, but what we should be looking at is a, a nociceptive terminal. So this will be an A, a uh, sorry, an A delta or C fiber, but a, a peptidergic one. And then the normal glutamate receptors here, we have kinate and AMPA. So we'll forget kinate for a minute and just focus on AMPA. That's the main receptor for glutamate. Um, and then a, a small amount of glutamate will stimulate the via the AMPA receptors will stimulate the nociceptive uh, the projector neuron, sorry, in the dorsal horn, and that will lead to the sensation of pain. We also see at the bottom here an inhibitory interneuron, and that's not really doing much there, but it's just preventing overflow and preventing too much excitation of that second order neuron. All right, so normal nociceptive transmission is a faithful relaying of intensity duration and location of noxious input. Okay, so this is very important for the periphery to let the central area in the brain know what's happening on the outside. Okay. Now in the first stages of central sensitization, the acute phase, what we see is um, the, the, the different number of receptors being involved here. So we've still got the AMPA receptor, which is a glutamate receptor. Now we're looking at NMDA receptors. These are, these are also glutamate receptors, but these are slightly different in that they can take in a, a larger ion size. So when you get sodium, potassium coming in, you can also get calcium um, and you just get a greater influx. Okay, they're, they're specific as well. They have this magnesium plug, which normally stops them being um, opened up. And it takes quite a lot of um, activity. So like a large barrage of impulse, uh, this wind-up phenomena, substance P, etc., for this magnesium plug to go away and allow the NMD receptor to, to open up and function as an ion channel. Okay, so with central sensitization, we have the normal AMPA channels plus these NMDA channels, and then we can also see there the NK1 receptor, which is the substance P receptor. Okay, so these all start to take part, and you get a much bigger impulse, and now the same amount of stimulation from the periphery will lead to a much bigger um, sensation of pain. So we get pain hypersensitivity. So we'll get hyperalgesia and we'll get potentially allodynia if there's a beta 5 is attaching to that same neuron. Okay, now this is again, this is still normal. This is normal physiology and it's uh, an important mechanism to pretend, uh, prevent more damage to the tissue. Um, and it's very much activity dependent. So you have to have an ongoing peripheral stimulus, so tissue damage, to maintain this synaptic plasticity. So all these changes will disappear as soon as you stop stimulating the peripheral nociceptors. Okay, so we can assume here that there's ongoing tissue injury. Okay, and it's a normal event to avoid further damage. Now the next stage of central sensitization, if it keeps on going, so this is if it's a really prolonged stimulus or for lots of reasons that we'll see later, if the threshold of the second order neuron is reduced for some reason, then we get these more permanent changes. So the nervous system is very much a plastic thing, it can change rapidly and from moment to moment. But now we're, we're going into this late phase where it's becoming slightly hardwired. Okay, and what we're seeing is actually Lots of um, sort of protein and enzyme cascades whereby prostaglandins are being produced from the second order neuron. They're diffusing back into the primary um, afferent fiber and they are going to be picked up on receptors there which further stimulates the nerve term terminal to release glutamate and substance P. We get arachidonic acids, we get coxes, we get interleukins there. So, so lots of these kind of cytokines and uh, mediates of inflammation being produced within the second order neuron and they will diffuse back in and further stimulate it. Okay, so now we're seeing the laying down of, of more receptor channels on the second order neuron. Okay, so for the same amount of stimulation of the peripheral neuron, we're gonna get a much greater um, response of that second order neuron. Okay, so again, hyper pain hypersensitivity, um, but here we may be looking at more of a diffuse pain sensitivity as these changes become more permanent and therefore all the other connections to these nerves, remember each of these projector neurons could have 
hundreds and, and thousands of nerve terminals attaching to them. So this could be happening to all of the other nerves that are synapsing on this one. So we get much more of a diffuse pain sensitivity. It's not localized just to that synaptic area. All right, now the final stage of this, so just to mention that a lot of this is altered transcription in the dorsal neuron. So this will be changes in the actual, um, the ion channels being produced in the nerve cell body of these second order neurons. Okay, and a little bit like we saw for peripheral sensitization when we get upregulation of receptors. Okay, so from the late phase of central sensitization, we go to the uh, um, disinhibition phase. Okay, now the disinhibition phase is actually where we lose these um, these inhibitory neurons. Okay, so these inhibitory neurons normally are sort of firing at a, a tonic rate, so they're permanently firing and just maintaining the uh, or just adding, putting a break on the peripheral and second order sort of synapse. Okay, so although there's no septive transmission in, and the brain needs to know what's going on in the outside, these inhibitory neurons are actually uh, sort of putting a break, just reducing it, making sure it doesn't go out of control. So although we're getting central sensitization, which is, as I said, a, a, an adaptive physiological um, event, at the same time these inhibitory neurons are putting the brake on and just preventing it getting out of control. Now after the late, sa late stage of central sensitization what we see is a um, uh, sort of huge barrage of activity and actually we start to get uh, increased calcium uptake for example into the, the inhibitory neuron and eventually the, ex the extra long barrage of um, noception will lead to the loss of this inhibitory neuron. Okay, hence why we call it disinhibition. So we reduced the inhibitory transmitter, we lost the inhibitory interneuron, and therefore we no longer have um, this local break, and also these are involved in descending modulation, as we'll see later. So one of the ways the brain stops us getting out of control in terms of painful injuries or hypersensitivity is to stimulate these inhibitory neurons. So once we lose them, we lose one of the mechanisms by which the brain can can stop this. So we're talking about stress-induced analgesia and, and lots of other forms of pain, pain relief. Um, we can no longer do them. Okay, so in this stage, this is this is getting very hardwired. So you've actually lost neurons, and it's uh, difficult for them to grow back. It takes a very long time. Um, plus, the things that maintain this generally stay there. So by the time you get to this this stage, the disinhibition stage of central sensitization. It's, it's very much hardwired. It ceases to be very plastic, and now we're looking at one form of chronic pain. This is still at the dorsal horn, um, but it's very likely this is happening higher up as well in the brainstem and in the other parts of the brain. Okay, so that was uh, the early stage of central sensitization, which is perfectly normal. The late stage, which has started to become hypersensitive, but it, again, is still plastic and be, can be reversed, and then disinhibition, whereby we actually get loss of interneurons and we lose that, that break and this can then get more out of control. Okay, so this is when it gets hardwired. Okay. And this all leads to what we see as persistent pain. Right, now I just want to mention one specific thing here. So homo, homosynaptic versus heterosynaptic central sensitization. So this picture here, we see on the left, we see uh, an impulse, a presynaptic impulse leading to a postsynaptic impulse. So the presynaptic is the same, but the postsynaptic is getting bigger. So this is a sort of form of wind up in the dorsal horn neurons. And this is because the, the second order neuron, or the postsynaptic uh, membrane is becoming more sensitive because of these substance P receptors, the NK1 receptor there, um, becoming more sensitive or making the, 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 um, the postsynaptic membrane hypersensitive to stimulus. So we have a, the same presynaptic synaptic stimulus leading to um, an increased postsynaptic stimulus. Okay, so that's central sensitization as we mentioned, and this is homosynaptic in terms of it's the same nerve going to the same terminal. So it's two nerves within the same synaptic uh, um, the same synapse, sorry. Okay, so that's homosynaptic. Whereas heterosynaptic is where you get 
sensation of the receptors to one peripheral neuron. So here we have, uh, on the left-hand side, we see the uh, nociceptive neuron, and on the right-hand side, we see a non-noceptive. So this is an A-beta fiber, both synapsing with the same projector neuron. So this would be a wide dynamic range neuron. Okay, and because of the increased barrage of um, nociception from the um, from the C fiber, we get glutamate, but we also get substance P being released, and that diffuses to a, a wider area around that postsynaptic membrane, which will be picked up at substance P receptors, the NK1 receptor, um, further away from the initial synapse, um, and often it will be very close to the synapse with these non nociceptive uh, primary afferents, so the A beta fibers. The activation of these NK1 receptors, the substance P receptors, causes a cascade of protein changes and enzyme cascades which will then alter the ion channels um, and produce more ion channels for the postsynaptic membrane of the A-beta fiber. So we'll get more, um, we'll get upregulation in terms of more receptors and more sensitized receptors, the so receptors that are easy to fire. Um, and this will code, this will cause by activating the A-beta fiber, so light touch, will cause this uh, postsynaptic memory to depolarize much quicker and the higher the, the input to that postsynaptic membrane the more the brain perceives it as a painful stimulus. Okay, so this is another mechanism by which we get um, allodynia whereby A beta fibers are causing pain and this is because the second order neuron has been sensitized by the nociceptive afferent uh, leaking substance P out of the synapse and in towards the um, postsynaptic membrane of the A beta fiber. Okay, so that's heterosynaptic central sensitization. Okay, so hopefully that's given us a few ideas of how we can get this allodynia and hyperalgesia. Um, here's a little diagram I, I put together, a bit of a little animation just to help you sort of consolidate that. So on the left hand side we have a C fiber, in the circles we have a, a vesicle of glutamate in green and we have um, substance P in red. And on the right hand side we have a dorsal horn neuron, so this would be one of these wide dynamic range neurons. And we have the AMPA receptor, which is a basic receptor for glutamate. We have the NMDA receptor, which again is a glutamate receptor, but it has this magnesium plug which blocks it, and it can only become active when it's um, initiated by a, a larger barrage of stimulus, or when substance P is involved. And then at the bottom we have the um, substance P receptor, the NK1 receptor. So normal nociceptive transmission occurs via an actual potential opening the voltage-gated uh, calcium channel, glutamate is dropped through, and then the AMPA receptor will pick up that glutamate, allowing sodium to influx, and that will kick off another action potential. So this is a normal synaptic transmission at the dorsal horn because it's a nociceptor C fiber. This will go on to give the sensation of pain. Okay, now if we look at the early phase of central sensitization, um, same picture, I didn't mention for the inhibitory neuron at the top there, but we'll come to that in a second. Okay, so same sort of thing whereby action potential initiates influx of calcium, glutamate goes to the AMPA receptor, and sodium influxes. Okay, but the more glutamate is released, so the higher the stimulus, we get the uh, unblocking of the NMDA channel and we get a larger um, stimuli, larger action potential in the second order neuron. Okay, now this is the extra barrage from the increased glutamate and the NMDA receptor starts to become active. So we get a bigger action potential. Okay, so that will be coded as, coded as increased pain sensation. So this will be one example of um, hyperalgesia or pain sensitivity. Okay. Now, if we go to the late phase, what we see is the exact same thing. We have the extra barrage of glutamate being picked up by the NMDA receptors. But we also get things such as prostaglandins, as we mentioned earlier, and also nitric oxide, which both diffuse back across the synapse into the presynaptic terminal, and that upregulates the presynaptic terminal to release more glutamate. So, and more glutamate as sub a substance P, sorry. So we see a situation whereby the presynaptic neuron stimulates the postsynaptic neuron, which releases chemicals um, and mediators of um, synaptic transmission, which diffuse back to increase the release in the presynaptic nerve terminal 
and therefore um, these will be picked up by the postsynaptic um, membrane. So we get this sort of feed forward or positive feedback response um, from this. Okay, so there's the nitric oxide diffusing across, increased release of glutamate, leading to an upregulation of these AMPA receptors. So we get more receptors in the postsynaptic membrane, so more glutamate will be picked up, and therefore the stimulus will be tenfold or hundredfold. If it's big enough, it will then lead to disinhibition, so destruction of the inhibitory into neuron. Okay, so we've seen this again here, the sodium, so the nitric oxide going across. Increased upregulation of AMP receptors, leading to a much bigger action potential, and this eventually will lead to sort of calcium influx into inhibitory interneurons and death of those neurons. Yep, so that was the early phase going through to the late phase. And then if this continues, continues unchecked, we get disinhibition, where we get destruction of the interneuron. Okay, so again, that's the three stages of central sensitization. Okay, so go back and watch that again if, uh, if it's not clear. Um, but right now we're going to move on to the next part. So we've just talked about nociceptors and uh, sort of nerve transmission. But we mustn't forget the the part that glial cells play here. So remember we have astrocytes which are very much involved in synaptic transmission. Um, we have uh, oligodendrocytes and Schwann cells which are creating the myelin sheaths to speed up transmission. And then we have the um, uh, microglia. And the microglia are like the macrophages of the ner central nervous system and they're these sort of rounded um, rounded cells that, that sit there and when there's any form of inflammation or even just excessive activation of synapses they become activated okay and here we see if we enlarge this picture we see how release of sort of substance p for example and glutamate can be picked up by the microglia causing them to be um, to change into the activated state whereby they can take part in um, inflammation and central sensitization and if we zoom into here we can see how that the microglia cell on the right, top right, is releasing cytokines, and these cytokines are directly um, able to stimulate the presynaptic terminal. And remember, cytokines are algogenic; they can cause pain, so they can diffuse back and cause more irritation and stimulate the nociceptor. Okay, so this will cause firing of the synapse, leading to more of a, more pain sensation, as well as local inhibition of some of the other interneurons. Okay, so this is just so that you remember that glial cells play an active role and actually this is a, an area of the, the pain field that's becoming very, very much at the forefront. Okay, so glial cell activation. Um, and it's not just for pain, it's for depression, neuropathic pain and all sorts of um, neurodegenerative diseases. Okay, almost finished. So I just wanted to talk about neuropathic pain um, because it's a specific, there's a certain, certain changes that occur that you don't see with um, non-neuropathic pain. So neuropathic pain is pathology to the nerve. So there must be some known nerve damage that's occurred here. So um, an axonotomy, for example, example, or a stroke taking out some of the central conduits or, or tracts um, or shingles post neuropathic post-herpetic neuralgia, whereby the shingle virus, is, the um, herpes zoster virus has is, is destroyed some of the nerve endings. Okay, so for neuropathic pain, there must be damage to the nerves, whereas central sensitization, you don't necessarily need damage, just an excessive use of, of the synapses. Um, here we see an injured nerve, so it's a peripheral nerve that's been damaged. And here we see what we get is an increased axonal sensitivity to all of the, the stimuli. Um, and because you've lost the peripheral um, or the, the distal end of that nerve, you get an ectopic firing. So you've damaged the myelin sheath, you damage the nerve itself, and actually you can get a, an ectopic or spontaneous firing of that nerve because of influx of the ions. Okay, so you get a constant depolarization, which can lead to constant pain and spontaneous pains. We get a sympathetic sensory coupling whereby we get sympathetic fibers actually growing into the dorsal root ganglion. And you shouldn't normally have this, okay? But now we get sympathetic fibers which release noradrenaline, and we get noradrenaline receptors 
actually um, becoming part of the the um, nociceptor itself. Okay, so this is a situation whereby a situation whereby stress, for example, will cause release of noradrenaline via sympathetic neurons, and now the sympathetic nerves are right inside the dorsal root ganglia, and those nerves have the the dorsal root ganglion nerves have noradrenaline receptors. So the stress response will lead to direct activation of the nociceptors. Okay, so now we have a situation whereby stress, anger, fear, all these things will cause pain, direct cause of pain, okay, not just because of the way it modulates the brain, but a direct sort of neurobiological um, activation of the nociceptors. We'll also see neuronal cell death of some of the nerves, and as we said, ectopic degen uh, potential generation. Now, here's the same sort of picture, but we're looking at the intact primary nerve. So, the, the first picture was all about the injured nerve, the one that was damaged, and what happens to that. This picture is about the intact primary nerve, sensory neuron. Okay, and what we see is actually sprouting. So the damaged nerve produces nerve growth factor, which it releases, and that gets picked up by the, the intact neuron. And we see collateral sprouting, so we're going to get more... Um, we're going to get... Come back. With collateral sprouting, we're going to get more nerve endings coming off from the original shoots. So we, we've now got more noceptive fibers, nerve fibers. Alter transduction. So the end of that peripheral terminal of that nerve will be uh, changed in terms of the receptors in there. Um, and we'll also get ectopic generation because you get laying down of receptors halfway along that nerve. So the nerve growth factor, um, while it's just desperately trying to regrow the damaged nerve, actually alters the, the nerve that's still there, leading to lots of changes that lead to spontaneous depolarization. Okay, so that's a big topic to just throw in there, I'm afraid, but if you can just listen to it again and have a little look around these subjects, because when we come back to talk about neuropathic pain, it's important you realise that there's, there's this hard, not just central sensorization, this can all lead to central sensorization, but you also get specific changes in terms of sympathetic coupling, um, ectopic depolarization, so collateral sprouting, etc. Okay. Good. Right. So now um, I was going to show this picture at the very beginning, um, but lots of new words. So if you just take time, if you just pause it in a second, take time to look at those words and make sure you're happy with them. Allodynia, we've covered. Um, anesthesia, you should be happy with. One of there's a couple there which you may not know. Dysesthesia, that's just the spontaneous or evoked unpleasant abnormal sensation. So paresthesia, we talk about pins and needles, whereas dysesthesia is pretty much every other strange sensation that a patient talks about. So if they talk about sensation of cold water running down their back or 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 ants in their skin, these are kind of forms of dysesthesia, which are very similar to paresthesia. Um, the other one I've labelled is hyperpathia, okay, and that's a delayed and explosive response to a noxious stimulus applied to the affected region. Okay, so hyperpathia is a, a delayed response, and it's, it's important to know this because quite often when we've got nerve damage or central sensitization, um, a patient can uh, can do something or can see a manual therapist, for example, who can treat them, and they may be fine the second day, first day and second day after treatment, and then they suddenly have a painful response. And that's uh, generally assumed not to have been caused by any of the treatment because it's such a delayed time. However, we know that nervous system can do this by being triggered and then having a very delayed response. So hyperpathia is not uncommon um, in people with central pain states. Okay, so just pause and make sure you're happy with that table because these are all words we'll be using a lot during the course. Okay. Right, so just to quickly revise this, this should be nice and simple for you. This is normal sensation, so we see the top neuron is a nociceptor, and if you stimulate it with uh, the yellow triangles there, we have heat, we have chemicals, we have mechanical um, stimulus, we get the sensation of pain, because it's a nociceptor, which is stimulating a nociceptor-specific neuron, or a, or a projector neuron, and that's giving us a sensation of pain. Um, the bottom diagram is the sensation of touch, and we have a, a feather tickling an A-beta fiber, and that will be picked up by the A-beta fiber and will go to other neurons that will, in the dorsal horn which will code for light touch. We can also see a, a branch of the A-beta going towards the 
um, nociceptor specific neuron or the wide dynamic range neuron and we have an inhibitory neuron okay but these are not activated here um, but when we go to central sensitization we'll see that an increased painful stimulus to a nociceptor onto a, a second order neuron that is sensitized we're going to get hyperalgesia and in the bottom picture we have a, a low threshold mechanical receptor an A-beta fiber which um, because of that uh, that branch going towards the um, second order neuron there which normally receives input from a nociceptor stimulation of it by the A-beta fiber will lead to allodynia okay so these are the two um, phrases we started off with the clinical pictures the hyperalgesia and allodynia okay so you should be happy with those by now okay and the last bit of revision I'd like you to do this graph is here and in a moment I'm going to show you the answers but I'd like you to pause it have a little think and see if you can fill in the, the, the missing spaces so what we have here is a stimulus a peripheral afferent fiber so a nociceptor or a, a innocuous fiber a dorsal horn whether it's normal or sensitized and then what we'd expect to uh, perceive so the first one for example is a low threshold stimulus so that's a uh, light touch on a low threshold ac um, afferent so that's an A-beta fiber with a normal dorsal horn you should get the sensation of light touch okay so I want you to pause it now and see if you can fill in the other ones okay okay and I'm gonna click now and tell, show you the answer so hopefully you have paused and if not then you are very naughty people um, okay so light touch and then a low threshold stimulus on a high threshold afferent obviously nothing because it won't set it off it's a high threshold afferent um, if it's a high threshold stimulus so noxious on a high threshold afferent so not no scepter we get the normal pain and with a low threshold stimulus or a high threshold stimulus on a sensitized nociceptor we're going to get primary hyperalgesia so that's the primary sensitization there then at the bottom two we get a high threshold stimulus so a noxious stimulus on a nociceptor on a sensitized dorsal horn gives us a secondary hyperalgesia and then a light touch on, a, on an A-beta fiber on a sensitized dorsal horn gives us allodynia and those bottom two are when it's central sensitization Okay, so hopefully you got those all right, and you're uh, you feel more than happy to proceed to the next next lecture. So you should be happy with sensitization, no scepters, difference between heat and mechanical, our hyperalgesia and allodynia, how peripheral sensitization is produced by upregulation of receptors, um, the difference between the primary and secondary hyperalgesia, being primary um, afferent fibers versus the dorsal horn, and then the different types of central sensitization. Okay, so it's a bit of a whistle-stop tour of those two quite big subjects, but hopefully you've got a, a, a sort of small understanding of them. Okay, thanks very much, and we'll see you in the next lecture.